darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Today we lift the candle of peace. And yet, we are still struggling here in our time to find, truly find, God's way of peace. Peace. The English <coughs> translation as a noun means freedom from disturbance, quiet, and tranquility. But also freedom from or the cessation of war or violence. It has also become a ceremonial handshake or brotherly, sisterly kiss that is exchanged during a Christian worship time, symbolizing Christian love and unity, passing the peace. As an exclamation, it's used as a greeting, or it's used as an, or as an order to remain silent. Peace! And yet it still eludes us. You can't watch the news or read the newspaper without sensing and knowing at the deepest part of who you are that we've not found that way But I'd like us to take a little different look at the word peace and look at the Hebrew word shalom. Because you'll see me write that at the end of letters, at the end of newsletter articles, at the end of emails, shalom. As a Hebrew word, it's used both as a greeting and a farewell. Yet it means so much more than peace, hello, or goodbye. Because most often, Hebrew words go beyond their spoken pronunciation. Each Hebrew word conveys feeling, intent, and emotion, unlike our English word for peace. Thus, shalom means completeness, wholeness, health, peace, Still today, many of us and others we know search for fulfillment and happiness and contentment in material possessions, money, sex, entertainment. But none of these things do anything to fill that little hole in our soul. 
things really just kind of distract us and prevent us from finding that true peace, that true shalom that enters into us when God is there. In Isaiah 9, 6, we hear the title, Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace. And that has been used both by the writers of our Gospels, but also by so many since the writing of our Gospels to describe the ministry and personality of the Messiah of Jesus. It is a mighty blessing when we use the word shalom. You are speaking all of those things that I said into someone's life. Blessing them with all of those myriad of wonderful things that shalom means. So don't say it unless you mean it. In Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 to 26, many of you know this. Yahweh, which is the name for God, because they cannot speak the name of God. But Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you shalom. In the name of Yeshua, Mamrashiach, Sar Shalom, in the name of the Prince of peace. I found a quote this last week that I could not find a um, an author for. Yes, all these are very important, and yet if you have no shalom, then all you will ever do is to no avail. Shalom Kavarim, Shalom Kavarim, Shalom Shalom, Lehi Trayot, Lehi Trayot, Shalom. Set 
come and watch you work. He says he wants to be a woodcarver when he grows up and would like to watch you since you are the best in the valley. <laughs> I'll be quiet. You won't even know I'm here. Please, please, piped in Thomas. With a grumble, the woodcarver stepped aside to let them in. He pointed to a stool near his workbench. No talking, no jiggling, no noise. <laughs> The widow McDowell handed Mr. Toomey a warm loaf of bread and cornbread as a token of thanks. Then she took out her knitting and sat down in a rocking chair in the far corner of the cottage. Not there, bellowed the woodcarver. No one sits in that chair. So she moved to the straight back chair by the fire. Thomas sat very still. Once, when he needed to sneeze, he pressed a finger under his nose to hold it back. Once he wanted desperately to scratch his leg, he counted to 20 to keep his mind off the itch. After a very long time, Thomas cleared his throat and whispered, Mr. Toomey, may I ask a question? The woodcarver glared at Thomas, then shrugged his shoulders and grunted. Thomas decided it meant yes. So he went on, is that my sheep you're carving? After another very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, Excuse me, but you're carving my sheep raw. Oh! <laughs> the widow McDowell's knitting needle stopped clicking. Jonathan Toomey's knife stopped carving. Thomas went on. It's a beautiful sheep, nice and curly, but my sheep looked happy. That's pish puff, said Mr. Toomey. Sheep are sheep. They cannot look happy. Mine did. They knew they were with the baby Jesus, so they weren't happy. After that, Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. When the church bells chimed to six o'clock, Mr. Toomey grumbled under his breath about the awful noise, and the widow McDowell said it was time to leave. <coughs> Thomas sneezed three times, <laughs> then thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a supper of cornbread and boiled potatoes, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his knife. He picked up the sheep. He worked until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. Griping and grumbling, he went to answer it. There stood the widow and her son. May I watch again? I'll be quiet, said Thomas. He settled himself on the stool very quietly while his mother laid a basket of sweet-smelling raisin buns on the table. Teapot is warm, Mr. Toomey said gruffly, his head bent over his work. While Mr. Toomey carved, the widow McDowell poured tea. She touched the woodcarver gently on the shoulder and placed a cup of tea in a bun next to him. He pretended not to notice, but soon both the plate and the cup were empty. Thomas tried to eat the bun his mother had given him as quietly as he could, but it's almost impossible to be seven and eat a warm, sticky bun without making various smacking, licking, and satisfying noises. <laughs> When Thomas had finished, he tried to sit quietly. Almost, he, once he almost hiccuped, but he took a deep breath and held it until his face turned red. And once without thinking, he began to swing his legs, but a glare from the woodcarver stopped him and he kept them so still, they fell asleep. <laughs> After a very long time, Thomas whispered, whispered Mr. Toomey, excuse me, may I ask a question? Run. <laughs> Is that my cow you're carving? <laughs> Nod and grunt. Another very long time went by, then Thomas cleared his throat and said, <clears throat> Mr. Doomy, excuse me, but I must tell you something. That is a beautiful cow, and the most beautiful cow I've ever seen, but it's not right. My cow will proud. <laughs> That's pish posh, scrawled the woodcarver. Cows are cows, they cannot look proud. It knew that Jesus chose to be born in its barn, so it was proud. Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. The only sounds that could be heard were the scraping of the carving knife and the humming of the widow McDowell and the click-click of her knitting needles. And when the church bells chimed six o'clock, Mr. Toomey muttered under his breath about the noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas shook first one leg and then the other, and he thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a
supper of boiled potatoes and raisin buns. The woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up the carving knife. He picked up the cow.